Welcome back to the Messy Reformation. My name's Jason Rice. I'm the lead pastor at Faith Community CRC in Beaver Dam, Wisconsin. My co-host is Willie Cronkey. He's a member at Pease CRC in Pease, Minnesota. We're just a couple of guys who love the Christian Reformed Church and want to see Reformation happen in our denomination. But we recognize that whenever Reformation happens, things get messy. And we're starting to see things get messy now in the CRC. So we're taking the opportunity to have conversations with pastors throughout the Christian Reformed Church to find out what's happening in our denomination, but also to talk about what Reformation might look like. If you haven't already, take a moment, click subscribe so you don't miss any of our upcoming content. We are dropping episodes every single Monday. You can also find us at our website, themessyreformation.com, and on Facebook as well. And if you like what we're doing and want to support our ministry, you can head on over to patreon.com backslash the messy reformation and you can support us there. The money you give there will go toward podcast hosting, website hosting, audio equipment, and a future messy reformation conference. With all that said, we're going to get to this week's episode, which is part two of our conversation with Willie on race in the United States and the CRC. Probably not everyone listening to this even under, knows what kinism is. So why don't, do you want to give us a definition of what kinism is? Uh, sure. The most basic definition that I can say is it's a form of racism that actually is rooted and grounded, they would say, uh, in the Reformed confessions and certain races being elected and preserved over against others, they would say they arrived at the conclusion of kinism or preservation of some races over another based off of that reformed hermeneutic. So that's in a nutshell what it is. It, it, I try to call it racism with biblical justification. Yeah. Uh, that, that's essentially what it is. And I think we know very well that there is none of that. Um, and that's what was being talked about in Synod 2019. And it was a very rewarding experience to be a part of that and to be in some of these conversations about people who were very militant and saying, no, we need to take a very serious stand against this. And so we did. Uh, it was declared a heresy. Uh, and I think there was a lot of conversation that went into that saying, you, I think before we declare something a heresy, we better be ready to say this person's not a Christian. Uh, and I think that that was a very important part of this conversation is, is it actually a heresy for somebody to say that somebody of a different ethnicity is lesser than others, or is it just an error in our theology? And the reason why I was happy that it was denounced as heresy is because of the uh, image of God, the imago Dei, um, when we look at human beings as created in the image of God. Is that everybody? Uh, I would say if that is everybody, then calling somebody less than the image of God is actually a mischaracterization and wrong understanding of who God himself is, uh, based off of who he has chosen his image bearers to be. Uh, and also, uh, by saying that these races, certain races can be uh, selected for salvation over against others, or maybe they inherit a lesser salvation, it's really an attack on the gospel itself. Uh, and it's really, uh, I would say, a, an overt contradiction of John 3, 16, when it says, this is how God loved the world. And it's talking about everybody, no matter what ethnicity that you're in, who is in cosmic rebellion against this God, who has chosen to put his love on these people anyway and not give them what they deserve in the moment that they deserve it. So I was very happy when they declared it a heresy because these things actually do attack the central heart of the gospel itself. And they really make salvation for some, but not for others. Uh, and they say uh, other things like you are equal to, but not as equal to, or just overtly lesser than. Uh, other people just based off of your skin color. So those were the conversations that uh, 
Synod had in 2019. I was very happy with uh, the conclusions that we came to. I do think at the end, it probably got a little long-winded. Um, mm. I don't want to say we gave it more time than it deserved, but I think we were pushing the boundaries there. If you want to go listen to that, it's it's all online, actually. Yeah. Well, and so I want to kind of move in a different direction then and, and go back to something you were kind of hinting at before. Um, so you, you were talking, I want you to dive deeper into this, um, a proper understanding of what racism is and, and how we're wrestling with that in our, in our culture today. Like what, what are the misrepresentations of racism going on in our culture right now? And then how is that kind of affecting the conversation in an unhelpful way? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, like I said before, racism pretty universally accepted is discrimination against somebody based off of their race, or I would say more specifically their ethnicity. I think if we understand human, humankind, our anthropology rightly, there's really only one race, and it's the human race with many ethnicities. Uh, so I think that's more precise. And I understand what people are talking about when they say racist or racism or races. Uh, so that's just a point of clarification that I will sometimes make when I think I've, I need to make it. Um, but I think real instances of racism are when somebody is uh, looked at suspiciously just because of the color of their skin. Uh, and they say, oh, I don't know what that person's up to. They, they might be one of those hoodlums. Uh, they, they might be up to no good. Uh, just because of the color of their skin. And if they look at somebody who's white, who presents themselves equally to that black person, but the person in question says, oh, no, they're fine. I, I, I completely trust them. I would say that is a real legitimate instance of racism, where you are judging and discriminating against somebody based off of their immutable characteristic. Um, now, where I think we conflate race and culture is another part of the problem here. Uh, because if I were to ask somebody, well, what makes you a racist? Well, you know, I don't like I don't like these black people who uh, drive such rundown cars or didn't graduate high school or their pants are sagging. The music they listen to, uh, the amount of kids that they have with this many women. And I would say, well, why are those issues completely isolated to the African-American community? I know plenty of white communities who have those same problems which actually means the issue there is not race. If you cannot directly link race to these behaviors, then it isn't actually a racial issue. It's a societal issue. It's a cultural issue that we have created based off of things that we believe. Uh, so I would say that is where I think certain things are helpful when it comes to defining racism. And then where we have uh, an unhelpful con conflation of the two. I don't know if that makes sense, but. Yeah, for sure. And so, yeah, you've been kind of, you were kind of insinuating that earlier and now you've made it clear. So that's good that, that you see some of the conversation right now um, or some things that are some of the issues that we're dealing with right now. And people are saying, well, we have this issue because there's a racism issue. You're mm -hmm. saying. Um, no, maybe this is actually an issue because it's a cultural issue. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so take, take, dive deeper into that. Well, that's correct, because I think, generally speaking, uh, and I've, I've had somebody ask me, is it wrong if I see, you know, I'm in you know, downtown Detroit and I see a group of four or five uh, black people approaching me? Is it wrong if I get a little uneasy and scared about what might happen? And I said, well, before I answer that, let's paint the scenario a little bit differently. What if there were four or five um, white men uh, dressed very similarly, they present themselves exactly the same, and they're walking down the street uh, uh, in your direction as well? Uh, would you be scared of them? And they, oh, yeah, I'd be scared of them. I said, okay then we see right there, the issue has nothing to do with the color of these people's skin. But first, it has everything to do with how these people are presenting themselves, what the culture is in the atmosphere that you're around, and the legitimacy of the threat that you think they might actually pose to you. Uh, so I think 
boy, that was probably a year and a half ago when I had that conversation. But when I had that conversation, the person went, wow, that makes total sense. Yeah, it doesn't have anything to do with what color they are. I say, no, it, it doesn't. Uh, it has everything to do uh, largely with the society that we have created based off of things like not having fathers in the home, not taking personal responsibility for your actions, uh, having a mentality of victimhood uh, instead of saying, I'm going to, I'm going to change things and break these quote generational curses unquote. Uh, and again, I'm a big presuppositional guy. So I think your presuppositions have everything to do with the way that you live. And if you enter into life with these presuppositions saying, I'm just cursed in these ways, it's because of the way that my parents lived and their parents lived and their parents lived are the way that I'm going to live. Uh, and I'm going to be stuck in this rut and I'm going to be forever impoverished. Uh, well, if you believe those things, then your practices will always accurately reflect your beliefs. That's why we see areas like inner city Detroit or Chicago or Minneapolis or Los Angeles. Uh, and we do see the single motherhood rate being, I think now it's past 70% uh, since 2022. Uh, and really, I always say these issues come back to the place where things matter most. And it's the home. This is where I actually think a strong element of our covenant theology comes in. Uh, because if we see a uh, male and female who created them, mother and father, it takes two distinct roles in genders to fully orb and shape a society, either for the society's benefit or to their detriment. And I would say the lack of fatherhood in these communities, and it's not just the African-American community, but that is the largest one by and large in statistics, then we get to see how these cultures are being created. We have gang violence, drug use, criminal offenses. All of these things are more present when there is not a stable man in the home who is the head of his household, accountable to almighty God himself and responsible for the family that he's been given. So those are my thoughts on the matter. Yeah. And uh, I've got two things. I, I'm going to affirm that. And then I'm going to play devil's advocate a little bit. Um, and, um, and so one of the things that we have seen, um, so you and I have seen this just living in rural Minnesota and mm -hmm. living, uh, you know, Malacca and North is a very poor area uh, of Minnesota. And so we've mm -hmm. actually seen these these generational things happening in, in the white community in, in rural Minnesota, where there's, there are certain families that we have ministered with repeatedly, and we can see generation after generation of fatherlessness and, and a lot of these same things. And we're looking at that saying, it's not because they're white. It's not because they, you know, I'm not seeing white privilege here. It's, it's a, it's a cultural issue that's happening in rural Minnesota that, that's, that are causing these issues, but, and now maybe I gave you an out on my, on my devil's advocate thing, but, <laughs> but one of the, one of the things that I hear um, quite often when, when somebody says, well, this maybe isn't a race issue, maybe this is more of a cultural issue. Um, I'll hear people push back and say, yeah, but we created these cultural issues in the black community based upon, um, you know, they're there because of systemic racism. There's Mm -hmm. That there were these racist policies that were put in place where, you know, black people could live in could only live in certain portions of of the city. And so we've kind of set things up in our country in order to shape these certain cultures. And so you can blame them and say, get yourself out of it. Um, but really, it's because of the sins of our past that have put these people in these cultures and these situations. And so uh, how do you respond to that kind of a pushback? Mm -hmm. Um, I'll start where I normally wouldn't start. Uh, and I would say I, I concede the point and I agree with the point that there were prior laws that existed in the United States that did prevent certain ethnic groups from advancing. That's why when people ask me, am I in favor of equality? I actually say, no, I'm in favor of equal access to rights. Uh, so there's a big difference between those two. 
Uh, I want everybody not to end up at the finish line. I think the finish line is determined by what you do after the starting line. I want everybody to be at the start of the starting line. Uh, but I would rebut those things by saying it's a direct contradiction, actually, of federal law. Um, people say, well, we, we have these communities because of past laws. Well, the Fair Housing Act was passed in 1968. And I think the Community Reinvestment Act was passed in 1977, along with the Equal Rights Act of 1962. Uh, all of these are actual federal laws that were created over 50 years ago, or very close to 50 years ago. And we still see these societal and behavioral circles and patterns in these communities. So I would say if these people are actually still being kept from advancing in their societies, well, then you actually have to show me the actual instances where they're being denied these things based off of their immutable characteristics of the color of their skin. Uh, and then, then I'm willing to play, play ball. But as far as I'm concerned, these things have been out of play for 50, sometimes even 60 plus years. So I guess I would approach these situations by saying it's not just racist, it's illegal for these things to be taking place. But first of all, the burden of proof is on you to show that in 60 plus years, uh, people have actually tried to make strides to ensure that these communities are embedded by their behaviors and the principles they stand behind. And I just don't think that's the case. Yeah. And so you're kind of going back to the comment you had made earlier saying, you know, show me the instance and make it clear mm -hmm. to me that this is that there's racism here and then let's fight for that. <laughs> but um, but just saying there's systemic racism seems to just lay out this kind of boogeyman where we don't even know where to start fighting. Right. Yeah. And it, it gives. Uh, people in these societies an excuse to just stay in the spot they are in and live off of the benefits that continually surround them. Um, I am a proponent of help ups. Uh, that's why if I know a family that has to be on food stamps or welfare or WIC for a certain amount of time so that they can actually advance themselves, I'm in favor of those things. And I want people to hear me right here. I'm not saying that African Americans are the only people on welfare. When the opposite is true, actually, there are more white people on welfare in the United States than there are black people. So let's just get that on the record. But what I'm saying is, I see these things as temporary aids to people who need them, who actually want to advance and be a net benefit to the society and the culture that they find themselves in. That's the only way out of these, quote, generational curses, unquote. At the end of the day, this actually does come down to individual decision-making and responsibility. And those things are fostered by uh, communities that they're actually in who actually uh, advocate for and stir each other up to love and good works, uh, as the author of Hebrews says. Uh, so I would say that comes from uh, having a good work ethic either instilled in you or learned, because I do think you can learn good work ethic. But at the end of the day, it comes to applying these things in these areas and not just saying, I'm here because so many of my generations were here too. Yeah. Well, and so that, that does give us a pretty good jumping off point to kind of come into our last question. Um, we typically ask this just in general about how do we, you know, what do we need to do to see reformation happen in the Christian Reformed Church? But I want to I want to apply this question just directly to the issue of race in America, um, but then I want to eventually get more specific and talk, how can we reform the conversation about race in the CRC? But, but what mm -hmm. steps do you think we need to take in the United States to help, to help this conversation become more helpful? That's a very good question. I appreciate it. I think the biggest thing, the biggest barrier we have to overcome is evaluating people as individuals over against the collective. Uh, when you lump people together and then uh, impute to them attitudes and practices and beliefs and behaviors based off of their immutable characteristics, I, I think we're only gonna find ourselves having unfruitful conversations and therefore not real solutions about these issues. I think if we're actually evaluating people as individuals, uh, saying that, okay, 
You are a separate person. Uh, you are somebody who is uh, a, even even a set apart person. Uh, you are somebody who has your own giftings and desires in how the Lord has equipped you. Uh, and then evaluate them based off of that basis. Then I think we actually get a lot further along here. Um, we need to to stop identifying everybody um, by their majorities or by collectives. I've told people this. Um, I don't want to be evaluated by any collective at all, unless you're talking about the body of Christ. Uh, because all other ground is sinking sand, and everything else, the Apostle Paul says, is transient. It's, it's fading away. It does not matter. In Christ, there is no Jew, there is no Gentile. I would apply that in this context. There is really no black. There is no white. All are one in Christ Jesus. We all have the same equal share in bearing God's image, and we all have the same worth and value that he has bestowed upon us because he says so as king of the universe. So I think if we start to evaluate ourselves on an individual basis over against a collective basis, then I think we're actually going to see a lot more progress in these communities too. And so as we as we jump into the, the question about how to reform this conversation in the CRC, um, I actually want to ask you, just based on what you just said, um, what are your thoughts about um, kind of this movement now? It's not just in the Christian Reformed Church, but since that's what we talk about, there's this movement in the Christian Reformed Church to try to make um, different uh, bodies of the CRC more more ethnically diverse, more gender diverse. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what are what are your thoughts on that move um, from our denomination? Mm -hmm. First, I want to see the hearts of the people behind this issue, and I don't think they're making these decisions and policies or recommendations out of malicious intent. Uh, I think they're trying to to have a broad representation, a fair representation of the expanse of our denomination. So I, I really do want to say I, I don't think there's a foul ball necessarily, but I do think it is misguided and it is misdirected. Um, I also find it interesting that uh, immutable characteristics were removed uh, to be delegates to synod when we decided to allow women as delegates to synod. They say, we're going to leave room for conscience here. So I find it doublespeak to say that women and ethnic minorities must be delegated based off of their immutable characteristics to participate in these meetings now. I would say you're, you're talking out of, of two sides of your mouth. So that's, that's not helpful here. Um, I think if, if somebody wants to nominate myself, for example, as a delegate to Synod or a young adult representative, which I, God willing, am going as again this year, um, I want that to be based off of, first of all, uh, my denominational involvement, um, how much actual skin in the game I actually have in this body. Uh, and second of all, I want to be put in such a role because of my passions and because of my giftings and about my care for the kingdom of God as a whole, as it relates to this denomination. I don't want it to have to do with the color of my skin or with the gender that I might be. Um, I, I don't see those things as very helpful. I, I see those things, again, as, as transient uh, and very short-sighted. Um, I just want to be a delegate because the Lord has predestined me in the good counsel of his will because he's gifted me in these ways, not because he's created me in this way. Amen. Yeah. And I think one of the problems that comes out of that, it just kind of hit me as you were talking, when we delegate people um, to positions based on their gender or based on their race, and they know that they're in that position to kind of fill the role of like, the woman of the group or the, mm -hmm. the minority of the group, we actually start to kind of disrupt the, uh, 
the discernment nature of the group. And that person now isn't there to discern, but there to be the voice of the black person in the group. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And there they become like, no, I'm the woman in this group. And so my job now is not to try to discern the Holy spirit necessarily, but my voice, I'm to be a representative of all women in this group, or I'm to be the representative of this minority group. And we kind of just disrupt the whole nature of what we try to do as a Christian reformed church to have this deliberative body. And we, we say that a lot, like we're not a representational body. When you go as a delegate, you're not a representative. You're not there to speak on behalf of your classes. You're here to deliberate. And yet when we put people into these positions based on race or gender, we're almost putting them in a position to be, not necessarily, but it ends up, they end up functioning like a representative of that particular race or gender. Mm -hmm. That's true. And I will say, I do not have any sort of moral authority to speak on behalf of any African American, just because I'm an African American. Uh, just like you don't have the authority to speak on behalf of all white people, just because you're a white person, or men, just because you're a man, or a woman, just because you're a woman. Uh, the ideas that we deliberate about and the recommendations we bring and policies we enact are there because we have been gifted in such a way as to actually bring embitterment because of the validity or falsehood of our ideas, which have nothing to do with what race we are or what gender we are. These things are meritorious based off of their truth, which is found in Christ Jesus himself and his word that he's revealed to us. So that's the basis that we need to evaluate these things on. And so what would you say then as a, as a Christian Reformed church, as we're, we're kind of wrestling with how to, how to do this well and how to have this race conversation well, and you have, you know, one side kind of really pushing, it, it, it does feel like one side really pushing kind of the cultural conversation and, mm -hmm. uh, and another side saying, tap the brakes a little bit. I feel like we're, we're not having, we're having a conversation that is, totally detached from scripture. Um, what do you think we need to do as a denomination to, to help this conversation be more helpful and, and bring us back to God's word? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I've stated this multiple times. Your, your presuppositions really do determine a lot. So I think if everybody is honest with themselves as to the true intentions of their motivations, uh, then I, I think we can actually start to have some more helpful conversations because it's one thing to just say, oh, I want to talk about race in the CRC. Uh, and I am somebody who raises an eyebrow and says, okay, do you have an agenda that you're putting forward because you want to talk about these things? Or do you actually see issues in our denomination related to race that you think we can actually accomplish in a conversation? Um, because one is is pretty disingenuous, but I think the other one, there's, there's a healthy skepticism there. So I think it's just being honest with ourselves and with our brothers and sisters in our denomination. And the other thing I would say, take off the uh, colored set of glasses that we have and just evaluate people as people. Uh, if you say a white cop was doing something to a black man, let's go ahead and just take all of the color out of that statement. Is the statement still true? Yes, it is. And in most cases, it's actually a better representation of the actual truth than it is by adding their color into the picture. So I think those things at the forefront are presuppositions, our honest intentions, and remember uh, that in heaven, there's going to be an innumerable number of people from every tribe and language and nation. And I wanted to read this section of Revelation chapter 7, starting at verse 9. Uh, the Apostle John writes this in his vision. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes, and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So I think 
if we see these people as individuals, as our brothers and sisters whom the Lord has given in his predestining sovereign wisdom and equipped us by his Holy Spirit to further the church that he is accomplishing on this earth, then I see these conversations going a whole lot better than being insistent on determining all these things based off of race and the color of people's skin. That's all we have for this week. Stay tuned next week for our conversation with Andrew Bjunk. Until then, don't forget this is Christ Church, and he bought it with his blood. And we've been warned that wolves will come in trying to destroy the flock. So keep a close watch on your life and on your doctrine. Preach the word in season and out of season, and keep fighting the good fight in this messy reformation.